Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome to the 21st lecture of surface engineering. In the previous lecture, we discussed uh, two very important types of uh, transformation products in steel, namely the perlitic and benetic transformations, both of them arising out of eutectoid transformation. Only the phase aggregate, the product aggregate is different in these two cases and, that's, and also they followed two different transformation mechanisms. But uh, today we are going to talk about Martensitic transformation, which is uh, very different in terms of mechanism, product morphology and the path taken. And uh, the basic difference arises from the fact that Martensite is a non-diffusion control transformation product or so-called shear transformation product uh, uh, as against diffusion control transformations of uh, the other varieties of perlitic and benetic transformation. So, let me just clarify this part uh, uh, right away that uh, when we talk of uh, diffusion control, then what we mean is that in a given lattice, if we have atoms which are located in, um, in certain positions like this, when the atoms move, they move from one designated position to the next. And they, so, exactly the distance of separation from one jump or the length at which an atom will jump from one to another position will be exactly the uh, multiple of interatomic distances. When we talk of shear, then the two neighboring atoms when there is a migration, the migration will not be exactly up to the uh, uh, next position of the, of the atom. It will be rather in the somewhat in between. So, the distance of separation will not be integral, but fraction of interatomic distances. So, when we talk of diffusion, then we are talking about uh, migration by interatomic distances, exactly interatomic distances in a given crystallographic directions on a given plane. Similar thing when we are talking about shear, then we are talking about uh, migration of atoms from one position to the next, which is not in exactly uh, distance equal to the interatomic distances, but a fraction of that. And this happens because of certain other reasons and under certain other compulsions, which we will discuss later. But uh, another important part that I would like to tell you is that, for example, when we, we talked about uh, uh, TTT and the CCT diagrams, and in the TTT or CCT diagrams, we, uh, we said that if this is the so-called TTT diagram, the corresponding CCT would be somewhat like this. And we said in order to avoid, in order to get martensite, which is the, this is the martensite start line, let us say. So, in order to hit this line without intersecting the perlite start or bainite start and finish, we need to employ a very fast cooling rate. And this gap, since it is less than a second for plain carbon steel, we actually need to employ a very drastic quenching. So, whenever you actually quench a hot uh, steel uh, component into some bath containing some fluid, so that you can extract heat faster, we would like to avoid this zone. So, whenever we drop a hot body into a certain fluid, there will be immediate formation of vapor blanket around and that will retard the heat transfer. And this is what is uh, going to happen in the first stage. So, during the quenching process, we would like to minimize this first stage as low as possible and would like to employ the second stage as much as possible, so that the heat transfer is the fastest and uniform during this stage. Now, um, when we uh, talk of martensite, we uh, need to understand that here the product is not going to form in equiax shape like growth in all directions to the same extent. This will not happen in case of martensite. Since it is a process dictated by shear and shear of set of atoms in a given direction, 
only by fraction of interatomic distances. So, if that shear happens in this particular plane, another shear happens in another plane, another. So, these are all parallel crystallographic planes and when the shear happens in them, the degree of shear is going to be different and as a result of which the morphology or the shape of the product that we develop will be more like a lenticular shape. That is because typically we may say that if this is the mid plane, if this is the mid plane and if the shear is happening to different, dis to different extent as we go from bottom to the top and also happening similar things uh, below the, uh, the dividing plane, then the overall shape of the product will look like a lens or a lenticular shape and a half of it will appear as a needle shape. So, needle or a spear shape. So, this needle or spear sh shape is typical of martensite as opposed to the polygonal shape of um, any other um, diffusion control transformation product. So, this is the kind of a shape is the, uh, what we always expect and typical microstructure these are real these are all sketches, but this is a real time microstructure in steel plain carbon steel, this is in alloy steel and this is in iron nickel system where we actually happen to see a morphology which clearly tells us there is a very large influence of orientation uh, present uh, orient influence of orientation for the growth of these kind of martensitic uh, plates. So, we um, uh, if we uh, move on uh, we also need to understand that where is this martensite coming from. So, for example, the initial uh, reactant is austenite which is interstitial solid solution of carbon in gamma iron the FCC iron and this in case of perlite we would have or bainite we would have expected uh, ferrite and cementite to form as a two phase aggregate. In case of martensite what we expect is a product which is either face center body centered tetragonal or low tetragonality cubic system. So, the crystal structure changes without any change in composition. So, if you initially are dealing with FCC cement FCC uh, austenite. So, this is the contour of such an FCC unit cell and in this FCC unit cell what you have will be the 6 atoms at the 6 face centering positions and 8 atoms at the 8 corners. So, you have 4 effective number of atoms per unit cell, but now if this crystal structure or this unit cell because of very large compulsion and no time given suddenly changes or is forced to change into and take up a new crystal uh, uh, unit cell, the possibility exists whereby you now have to consider these four atoms on the top plane, these four atoms at the bottom plane and one more at the center which earlier was the face centering position. So, now we are looking at formation of a new unit cell out of the existing, existing FCC unit cells. So, two neighboring FCC unit cells from the two neighboring ones we have squeezed out a new unit cell whereby the length here is exactly the same as the length in this direction, this direction. So, the length is exactly a naught, but on the other two directions the lengths are now shortened squeezed uh, by an amount of a, a naught over root 2 because this length is uh, you can easily calculate that this length will be root 2 a and half of that will be just a upon root 2. So, this means that earlier an FCC unit cell where a where a b and c were all equal and we had 4 effective number of atoms per unit cell is now transformed into a new unit cell which has 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, 6, 7, 8. So, 8 atoms at 8 corners, but um, so effective number is only 1 and 1 in the center of the unit cell. So, another so 2 per unit cell, but the difference is that this 
axial length is different than the two other axial two other axes. So the from this part the product what actually emerges is going to be a tetragonal unit cell because A is equal to A. So, in x and y direction they are equal, but in z direction they are different. So, A is equal to A, but not equal to C and this is possible if we assume that as if the entire transformation is happening due to some readjustment of such a, a, a change in crystal structure from FCC into uh, body center tetragonal. But this is hypothetical. In reality, this kind of a Bain distortion model is not valid, but good enough for us to understand as to how a tetragonal crystal lattice can emerge from uh, existing uh, 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 face centered cubic lattice without necessitating any large scale rearrangement of atoms, except that the atoms need to just move by fraction of interatomic distances from one position to the next and uh, allow such new unit cell to emerge. So, this is the overall microstructure, this is a real time microstructure and uh, one other thing what we should know is that the amount of carbon is very important in developing such tetragonality. For example, here it is manifested in terms of a surface dependent property called hardness as a function of carbon. So, if we increase the amount of carbon the hardness of the steel increases and that is purely because the supersaturation in modern site increases with uh, 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 more and more addition of carbon. In fact, the distortion that we were talking about now is uh, better understood here. So, uh, typically in, in, in a BCC lattice which is what you expect at room temperature. So, FCC tries to transform to BCC, but the carbon which has the option of going either into this face centering position uh, uh, of the BCC unit cell or middle of the edges. So, this would have uh, octahedral coordination and th this would have a tetrahedral coordination. So, if it chooses either of these positions, for example, if it goes to the middle of the edges, then we see there is immediate uh, lattice expansion in this direction. So, it is exactly because of this reason. Uh, in a tetragonal unit cell where you expect that uh, the C direction to be uh, larger than the A and B direction. So, this uh, uh, tetragonality or deviation from the cubic uh, uh, geometry is going to be uh, larger if the amount of carbon is more. So, in fact, that is exactly what we see that as we increase the amount of carbon, the hardness of steel which is coming from martensite increases and this is uh, felt until about a certain limit of addition of carbon. So, this is an empirical relationship which actually says that if you increase the amount of carbon, the tetragonality the uh, C over A ratio increases and because of which the hardness increases. But when you actually pump in more or dissolve more amount of carbon, it is not only the tetragonal martensite, but even in austenite which is the parent phase where from martensite actually forms. Even in austenite the, uh, the lattice parameter increases and so does in case of uh, the C axis of the tetragonal martensite, but you see a certain amount of contraction. So, that is what we saw already in, in our previous slide that um, the uh, in the Bain, Bain, uh, Bain distortion model that the C axis expands whereas, the A uh, and uh, these two axes uh, they contract. So, carbon plays a very important role in defining the tetragonality of martensite in terms of these two uh, lattice uh, constants and uh, eventually that determines the overall mechanical property of martensite. We also have understood that this is a process whereby no large scale solute partitioning takes place and transformation is through shear which essentially requires the atoms to move only by fraction of interatomic distances and not by integral multiple of interatomic distances. So, now actually I decided to make a summary for you to uh, follow the martensitic transformation uh, in the nutshell. 
So first of all, the name Martensite comes from the uh, German scientist, Mart metallurgist, who actually first uh, uh, proposed the existence of Martensite in steel because of uh, fast quenching. So it is the hardest solid solution phase possible in steel. Uh, we are talking about not the har hard, not the hardest phase, but hardest solid solution phase, because the hardest phase in iron carbon system is the um, interstitial compound called cementite. So martensite is usually hard, and in fact, it is because of this strength we always are so much interested in martensite. But there is no necessity that martensite always have to be hard. For example, if you go to iron nickel system or titanium nickel system the martensite that forms are called thermoelastic martensites and they are actually uh, in as quench condition they are not necessarily very hard. They, the strength of those martensites arise because of or those alloys arise because of another phenomenon which follows the transformation and that is uh, precipitation hardening. Now martensite again is not necessarily occurring only in steel it can occur in very many non-ferrous systems. Um, in fact, I have listed a large number of systems here. These are ferrous systems, but you see martensite can also arise in many other alloys which are not necessarily um, uh, steel, which are non-ferrous alloys. It can happen even in non-metallic systems, for example, in zirconia, which is an oxide. It can happen in various minerals, solidified gases at ultra low temperature, in inorganic, various inorganic compounds and even in polymers. So, uh, though we often uh, tend to believe that martensite is almost the prerogative of steel, but that is not true. Uh, so, what is important for us to know is that martensite is a product of a transformation of a particular mechanism of transformation and is a generic name not only confined to steel, it can happen in other systems as well. But in this surface engineering course, the reason why we are discussing so much about martensite or pearlite or bainite is because a large number of components, large number of bodies, large number of engineering applications are based on steel and when we want to improve upon their life or uh, their performance, we do uh, uh, carry out certain transformations onto the surface which employ exactly the same type of phase transformations that we are discussing so far. But the most important thing in, in case of martensitic transformation is the nature which is diffusionless. That means the atoms move not by integral multiple of distances, but by fraction of interatomic distances. It happens at very low temperature where diffusion is very low. In fact, that is one of the reasons why, for example, when you quench all the way from 800 to room temperature the diffusion coefficient actually decreases by orders of magnitude and at room temperature or sub below room temperature the diffusion coefficient is so low that it will take uh, years for any transformation uh, which is possible at high temperature to happen at room temperature. So there is no thermally activated migration involved and uh, atomic transport is purely by shear and which again I must re-emphasize is by a fraction of interatomic distances. Another very important feature is that there is no change in composition. So when you talk of perlite or bainite, you start with austenite and there is immediate solute separation so that two different phases form like ferrite and cementite. Ferrite would typically contain a carbon to the tune of 0 0.025 weight percent carbon, whereas cementite will have 6.67 weight percent carbon. So, from about let us say if you are dealing with a 0.4 or 0.6 percent carbon steel, which is what will austenite contain. So, point, point, from 0.6 percent carbon, you swing all the way uh, uh, to two different phases of alpha and Fe3C, which uh, if this contains let us say 0 0.6 percent carbon. So, you are now talking about a phase uh, compositional uh, variation as large as this. In case of martensite, there is no such phase, no such solute segregation or solute separation. So, whatever carbon you have in gamma will be retained in martensite. In other words, you actually produce a highly supersaturated solute solution. 
we'll come to that as to why martensite is so hard. Uh, this is this kind of a transformation where crystal structure changes, but composition doesn't change is very similar to the allotropic or polymorphic changes or even massive transformations. But here uh, all these uh, uh, again the point of distinction is that allotropy or polymorphism or massive these are diffusion control transformations whereas martensite is a shear transformation product. Martensite is also a heterogeneous uh, process. So, nucleation occurs typically at grain boundaries or different martensite plates or even dislocation tangles and so on. But the nucleation barrier is very, very low uh, and also the interfacial energy is very low. So, nucleation, so typically in any nucleation process when we talk of this barrier, this barrier in case of martensite is very, very small because the interface actually is of very low energy. So, martensite can actually form in the, uh, can actually manifest in the form of plates, lats or needles. I am sorry, there is a, a spelling mistake here. Uh, uh, then um, it can be, uh, but it is always confined within the parent grain, which is the parent grain of austenite. So, if this is the parent austenite grain and if martensite plate forms, it can go all the way up to the boundary, but never crosses and moves to the other uh, crystallite uh, across the boundary. Now, the morphology usually as I said is of lenticular shape. So, typically you would expect a lens like shape and if you see the half of it or uh, take uh, your uh, section is such that you are viewing at a different angle. So, you tend to see such needle like or spear like structure. But you also can have uh, instead of lenticular or lath type, you can also see butterfly or plate type or midrib structures and so on in primarily in non-ferrous systems. Martensite is the hardest solid solution because of very many reasons. Most important is the supersaturation. Higher the amount of carbon, greater the supersaturation and greater is the strength. Also because it has very small plate size. I would rather not use the term grain because we are not talking about polygonal shape, we are talking about uh, large aspect ratio lenticular or plate or uh, spear like shape. So, very small plate size. The crystal structure is BCT which uh, is certainly less plastic and hence less number of slip systems available compared to uh, the parent austenite which has an FCC. There is lot of internal strain involved because of the uh, contraction and expansion in two different directions. Martensite contains a large uh, density of dislocations because of the large stresses created during the transformation and you have very few or very poor slip systems. So, all these are important reasons as to why martensite is the hardest solid solution. The transformation is irreversible because uh, you know unlike in case of say perlite where you actually uh, go to ferrite and cementite combination, but when you reheat you get back the austenite. In case of martensite, austenite transforms to uh, martensite, but when you reheat martensite you do not necessarily uh, get back austenite. You actually martensite dissociates into perlite which is ferrite plus cementite and then if you reheat then you go back into austenite. So, this is not directly reversible transformations, but in some other systems they can be completely reversible. For example, titanium nickel, iron nickel and it is because of this reasons these classes of alloys typically show the phenomenon called shape memory, which is totally absent in case of steel. Now, um, the transformation occurs uh, basically below a temperature called martensite start. Now, uh, typically if you again refer to the uh, CCT diagram, now let us refer to the CCT diagram. So, you will see there an MS martensite start and MF which is martensite finish transformation which are just lines and not curves. They are lines because martensite is an a thermal transformation. It is not uh, temperature depend, it is a temperature dependent, but it is not thermally activated process. So, you require so much of driving force in terms of undercooling, but once you start even if you hold here for uh, infinite time, the volume fraction of the phase will not change. The volume fraction of phase of martensitic product 
will change only when you go to lower and lower temperature. That means, when you increase the driving force in terms of undercooling. In case of diffusion control transformations, we all know that if we hold at an isothermal condition, the product volume fraction increases with time. So, that is a time dependent transformation. Martensite being an athermal process is a time independent transformation. We must uh, know that uh, Martensite actually is a very rare transformation which occurs at very high speed almost at the speed of uh, propagation of sound, but with a coherent glissile interface. We did talk about the role of uh, crystal defects and uh, generally we found we did discuss at that point of time that an, if an interface is coherent, then the mobility is generally very low, but here we are seeing a very rare combination where we are saying that the interface is coherent and yet highly glissile, so much so that it can move at a pace which is almost equal to the velocity of sound. The temperature, the so called MS and MF temperatures uh, can be uh, raised to slightly higher level by applying plyer deformation and then the start temperature is called martensite deformation, martensite transformation start by prior deformation. So, M D is a raised level of M S by way of because of prior deformation, because these prior deformations produce lot of dislocations which act as nucleation sites for martensites. So, hence even with slightly lower undercooling, in normally you require so much undercooling, but even with slightly lower undercooling, now martensite can start nucleating because of the presence of large density of dislocations due to prior deformation. Now, um, we uh, generally the volume fraction and the plate size of martensite uh, you can control by the extent of cooling or heating uh, and uh, in fact, in some other systems actually they can behave uh, completely reversibly uh, so called thermoelastic uh, or rubber like nature, but this is not in steel, but in some other non ferrous systems. We, I already mentioned and let me repeat that the growth occurs by cooperative shear displacement. So, essentially if one plate moves this much, another plate moves this much, another this much, another this much. So, until the mid plane the, the degree of shear varies. In other words, from the mid plane as you go up or away from the uh, uh, central plane, the degree of shear actually decreases and as a result we end up seeing such uh, lenticular shape. So, that this lenticular shape develops because of that. Now, the, when the transformation takes place actually there are the, one can define a certain reference plane called the invariant or the habit plane where martensite usually nucleates. Now, if you compare with uh, plastic deformation, we always say that uh, dislocations are prone to move or finds it easy to move in slip systems comprising closely packed and loosely stacked. So, essentially we are talking about planes which are wide apart, but very closely packed. So, the atoms should almost touch each other. In case of martensite, we see just the reverse. Remember for diffusional transformations, we require closely packed and loosely stacked planes. In case of martensite, we actually require atoms which are rather widely, uh, rather wide uh, that are, uh, slightly wide apart, but very close by, the planes are very close by. So, just the opposite for martensitic transformation, we require wide apart, but, but closely packed planes. And these kind of planes, this kind of restriction actually uh, brings us to the possibility of seeing this transformation occurring on some specific types of planes called habit planes, which uh, is this described here. For example, in iron 30 nickel alloy or in typically in steel or in some other, other alloys, there will be uh, certain planes where such kind of uh, transformation or uh, uh, martensitic transformation is favored and that is purely arising out of the fact that for shear you actually require atoms uh, slightly apart. So, that the atoms can move by fraction of interatomic distances and not hop from one place to the very next possible position. The uh, this uh, invariant deformation 
uh, that happens uh, in case of Martin's egg tr transformation leads to invariant plane strain. And uh, there is, of course, there is no uh, uh, slipping, but uh, there could be, this can lead to formation of certain amount of twin. So, it is quite commonplace that certain martensites actually would be largely twin martensite. Um, in case of, uh, uh, in case of uh, non ferrous systems, this uh, invariant plane strain can create stacking faults. So, that is also sort of crystallographic defects which further makes uh, deformation or deformability difficult and in the process increasing the increases the strength. The most important point at um, uh, part that we must remember that entire driving force for martensitic transformation primarily comes from uh, which is uh, primarily is of chemical nature which essentially means that if this is the uh, uh, if this is the austenite we are talking about and if this is the eutectoid point, when we quench all the way to very low temperature. So, this is in terms of the phase diagram and in terms of the kinetic diagram. If we are, if this is the austenite start and if we are quenching all the way from way above austenite start and quenching way below, then this large delta T is proportional to a very large supersaturation and this is exactly the driving force for martensitic transformation. So, when you make life so difficult that you are quenching all the way from above 800 to room temperature or below in this very large decrease in temperature quenching, uh, you are not allowing any time at all for diffusion to take place. So, there is no perlite, no bainite and then the solution austenite has to transform because uh, it is highly metastable uh, because of this very large undercooling and the only way it can now transform is by shear by fraction of interatomic distance movement and not by diffusion control transformation where atoms move by integral multiple of interatomic distances. So, it is time to recapitulate. Um, so, in this uh, uh, last half an hour or so we have discussed only about martensite and of course, uh, at times compared with perlite and bainite. I think by now it is clear to you that uh, the martensite is a shear transformation product where atoms move by fraction of interatomic distances, retains the entire supersaturation, the entire uh, amount of carbon that you had in austenite. You need drastic quenching so that you do not allow any diffusional transformation like perlitic or bainitic to intervene and weaken or reduce the supersaturation. Uh, uh, we discuss as to what are the other possible reasons like uh, lack of slip systems or uh, relatively complex crystal structure like body centered tetragonal, uh, a very small uh, size of the plates or the platelets and so on. Because of all these reasons we see martensite as the hardest solid solution. Uh, the growth mechanism is uh, completely different compared to perlitic or bainitic and for that matter any other diffusion control transformation including allotropy or uh, massive transformations and so on. Um, why is martensite relevant to uh, surface engineering at all? It is purely because uh, very soon we will start discussing about various techniques for surface hardening and when, whenever we talk of surface hardening of steel we will definitely uh, invoke the concept of formation of martensite onto the surface. And we would rather like to create a situation where we transform the austenite, we heat the surface to austenitic state, make it uh, austenite and then subsequently by rapid quenching onto the surface, we convert the surface into martensite, but not the core. So, we, the core can very well be retained as perlite, so that the toughness is retained and uh, uh, the ability to absorb energy is retained, but the surface becomes predominantly martensite so that it can withstand or resist uh, wear or any other kinds of uh, uh, degradation. Um, we talked of uh, briefly, we alluded to various possibilities of martensite being non hard or not as hard as in steel and that is typically in case of uh, non ferrous systems. And we also found out that martensitic transformation or this shear type of transformation um, as a generic mode of transformation is possible in very many systems, even in non-metals, solidified gas, uh, ceramics, oxides, even in some polymers. But finally, one question that 
to we should ask ourselves that if martensite is so good and so beneficial, would we care to have 100 percent martensite in the bulk or on the surface? The answer is no. The answer is no and you have to find out as to why 100 percent martensite is not desirable. And I can give you an only one hint that though martensite is very hard, martensite also is brittle. So, it cannot absorb energy and hence it can lead to easy formation of cracks. So, thank you very much.